Welcome to this seminar uh, organized by Act Church of Sweden, Seman i Sjönsjönen och uh, Olof Palme Centret. Today we will be here to discuss um, and talk about uh, a seminar which has its starting point in the legacy of Desmond Tutu and the Anglican Church and the strive for freedom and justice during uh, the apartheid era. era. When Desmond Tutu was born in 1931, the world he lived in was different from the one we experience right now. Yet, we are still, in some ways, fighting the same struggle. And indeed, he knew what the price for that fight was. A quote from him, all of us experience fear, but when we confront and acknowledge it, we are able to turn it into courage. Being courageous does not mean never being scared. It means acting as you know you must, even though you are undeniably afraid. Our seminar is called in Sweden, Att stå på modets sida, standing on the side of courage. And that is what we want to talk about today. We want to talk about what that means in the present situation in South Africa today. But we also want to talk about it from a global perspective, seeing the global challenges uh, against our common democracy. And we want to land in a, in, a, in a discussion and thought about what can we do to build a new common global movement which will together strive for, for these common values of human rights, democracy, equality. And to get, uh, to, uh, with me, I have a very distinguished panel. Um, with me here in the studio is our Archbishop of Church of Sweden, Antje Jacqueline. And uh, we have Desmo uh, from, from South Africa, from the Anglican Church, we have Archbishop uh, Tabu Makoba. Also from South Africa is the Swedish ambassador to South Africa, Håkan Juholt. So we will have three different perspectives with us, but we will all join uh, course in this very interesting and common discussion. And I want to start, and what I will say to you all is that we will have, I mean, we have three very interested people here, but we will talk in different sections, even more two and two maybe, and then we will go through, so we will land together in a common discussion at the end. But I want to start off with you, Archbishop Tabu. Um, you are, you, you have, you're part of the Anglican Church, you've been so for many, many years part of the legacy of our Archbishop Desmond Tutu. But what do you remember yourself from those early years when you were part of, of the fight against apartheid and the fight for democracy and equality for all? Uh, th th thank you so much. And uh, let me greet my fellow panelists, uh, two people that I, I, I dearly respect and um, uh, Particularly, as with Anje, uh, I remember coming to her consecration, and I remember her uh, visiting us here in Cape Town at home. So, uh, the, it is an honor and a privilege indeed. Um, per perhaps one should start by, by, by looking at uh, when, uh, at a personal level, when apartheid uh, the uh, laws denied me the opportunity to go to a multiracial university, and I had to get uh, what they called a ministerial approval, a permit, because I was black, and as a black uh, uh, a child, um, we were supposed to go to uh, black universities uh, that were very far from uh, our home. I also uh, uh, remember when my family was forcibly removed uh, at the back of a government truck from Alexander Township uh, to a place uh, in Soweto. Um, and uh, that uh, removal, forced removal, uh, created what I call a heartache for my, my dad, not a physical, but an emotional uh, uh, problem. And he died later. Of, of, of a heart attack. I, I remember also um, being arrested as a youngster because I was, I was tall and thin. Uh, 
And for my age, uh, at that stage, uh, I was arrested randomly because I didn't have uh, the dorm pass uh, to travel around uh, the urban centers of Johannesburg. And when I explained uh, to the Dutch policeman that uh, arrested me that I'm still a scholar and uh, I, I am not yet at the age of carrying the pass, uh, he said, no, um, you're a liar. So I landed up uh, with my books and my uniform in one of the uh, jails, uh, uh, holding cells in Johannesburg. But I also remember Desmond Tutu, and I'm glad it really shouldn't be about me, it should be about celebrating uh, this great uh, icon uh, in our nation. When I said, it is tough, Desmond, uh, I'm considering take joining uh, for military training to join the armed struggle uh, against South Africa. And Desmond Tutu helped me to focus in getting a good uh, education uh, uh, in South Africa. And so those are some of my, my, my memories of him and my memories of, 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 of apartheid. Maybe let me take a pause uh, there. Thank you. And Håkan Juholt, um, you were a, a young man in those days. And you were um, also, you were an, a politician by then, I understand, but also an activist uh, involved in the struggle from a Swedish perspective. Uh, what do you remember, but also what, what do you think the, uh, what was the, um, what do you remember of that, of those days? And what, why do you think also South Africa became so, so such a, people became so engaged in the situation in South Africa specifically? Because it was a movement in Sweden, wasn't it? Absolutely. First of all, thank you for inviting me to this discussion. And uh, it's really a privilege. And uh, I want you to know that all my daily work, I try to do whatever I can to connect Sweden and South Africa in all different fields. Uh, we need to do more together. And we can do so much more together, built upon common values. So I really admire you for this discussion. And I'm most thankful and humbled to be part of that. Answering your question, yes, uh, 1976, I become a political activist in my hometown, Oskarshamn in Sweden. And I remember very well standing up to my knees in snow, raising money to ANC and Spapo. And uh, 1982, I was elected member of the city council. And we remember that 86, there was this global boycott against Shell, the oil company. And uh, we had a debate in the city council where I were in favor of a boycott that the city should not buy any oil or petrol from the Shell company since my city, Oskarshamn, should be a part of the global boycott. Uh, and uh, I remember that very well. It was one of my, my most proud moments in, in, in the municipal politics. and. Uh, when I arrived here a year ago and had the opportunity to meet with President Ramaphosa, handing over my credentials as new Swedish ambassador, I took the opportunity and mentioned that to him. And then he said, wow, that idea, that boycott was my idea. <laughs> so, I mean, that's the circle of life. Uh, me, young, taking part in this boycott now, close to the 60s, I meet with the president who had this idea. So uh, I'm very humbled to be here. And uh, I can see that we can do so much more together because our friendship is so long lasting, full of respect, mutual interest. And Sweden have never ever had any colonial ambitions. We just want to be equals in a traveling world. So uh, thank you for inviting me to this. And um, Archbishop, uh, Archbishop uh, Antje, with this background, very short background, listening to this uh, distinguished uh, gentleman, um, Ak Church, uh, Church of Sweden was also part of this movement that Ambassador Håkan mentioned earlier. 
And I've understood that this is, could be seen as the prophetic voice of the church, which is also something we said we will discuss in this, in this uh, panel talk. But what does that really mean? Uh, thank you for the question and wonderful to see both my brother Archbishop Tabo and Ambassador Håkan Juholt. It would be nice to be good together in the same room, but isn't it wonderful we can have this time together anyway. Um, I started to work as a parish pastor in the Church of Sweden in 1980, mm. uh, but it was not until I worked as a professor at the Lutheran School of Theology in Chi at Chicago between 2001 and 2007 that I really got reminded of what the Church of Sweden had done in those days. I think in Sweden we didn't talk that much about it, mm. and maybe that had reasons. But one day I remember serving as a professor, a student entered my office and said, I know that the Church of Sweden did so much in this uh, struggle against apartheid. Mm. I want to write about this. Mm. Can you help me? And I couldn't. <laughs> this was quite embarrassing. Mm. Um, but um, anyway, uh, it is good to, to bring these memories mm. back to life and also to actually to, to tell, those, tell about those memories to the young, younger mm. generation. I think mm. that is very important. And that is a part of being prophetic, even mm. telling the stories of the past. Now you asked what, what it is to be prophetic. Mm. Um, when we think of prophets, of course we think of the prophets of the, uh, in the Hebrew Bible, mm. or the Old Testament as we call it, and especially those prophets, now they are false prophets and true prophets, and the prophets we choose to listen to are those um, that really speak truth to power. Uh, there are those who uh, voice critique against those in power. Uh, the prophets are those who are the voice of justice and who uh, give voice to those who have been taken away by right to speak. But they are also the voice of promise. Mm. I think that makes them different from just uh, critical voices in society. Mm -hmm. They also speak the voice of promise and the voice of comfort. Mm -hmm. uh, and they are marked by a holy stubbornness. Mm -hmm. They keep to what is their task and what is their message. They keep to it. Mm -hmm. And they also uh, perform symbolic actions mm -hmm. which illustrate the message. And they have the courage to deviate, mm -hmm. the courage to be different. What does that mean for Church of Sweden today? Um, I think it means the same thing every time, <laughs> every period of time, uh, to, to reflect, to listen, to listen, of course, to the voice of, of, for us, the voice of the gospel, the voice of God, and listen to the cries of those mm. who are not heard, mm. and bring the gospel to speak, in especially in situations of conflict, in difficult situations, in situations of oppression. Mm. And, and um, Archbishop Tabo, you once said that if the church is not po political, we've failed in our mission. W what does that mean? Uh, th uh, th thank you very much. And, and um, I, I think uh, Archbishop Anjas uh, response uh, uh, helps place uh, my answer in context. And if I may reply to that uh, in a form of a narrative, I mean, in South Africa, the introduction of apartheid in 1948 broke the link between the Anglican Church and the ruling establishment. Uh, you might even say that, ironically, uh, apartheid saved uh, the Anglicans in Southern Africa from being viewed as the church of the oppressor. We did not always speak uh, strongly enough against apartheid, nor did we match our rhetoric uh, with action uh, in those days. But from the 1950s, individual priests and bishops whose Christian consciences were so offended by the blatant racism of apartheid uh, started speaking up. 
And in the 1960s, church leaders of all major denominations except the white Dutch Reformed Church spoke out more boldly against the suffering apartheid brought uh, to some of us and to our elder sisters. And so in 1970, the combined influence of African theology, liberation theology, and black theology helped the church to take a stand against oppression. It also nurtured the likes of generation of black leaders like Desmond Tutu, uh, who is best known uh, uh, in the world, uh, who spoke out publicly uh, against the atrocities of apartheid who led marches and advocated sanctions uh, to um, isolate the South African regime. And so for me then, at, at the heart uh, of uh, what is uh, prophetic theology is knowing that the church and the state uh, sh should have the same interests when it comes to the wealth of God, the welfare of God's people who are also citizens of the state. Yeah. But if the state and the church do not do their jobs properly, yeah. woe are both. If the state acts against the interests of its citizens, even worse, if it becomes an enemy of its own people, we have a duty to defend uh, God's people. That is when we speak with a prophetic uh, courage, prophetic voice. Mm. When a political system in action, whether colonialism, apartheid, or corruption in democratic South Africa demean God's people and fail to address the concrete needs of the people, we need to speak out. Whether corruption uh, that has taken hold in some parts, for example, in South Africa of the ANC, or uh, on the issue of vaccine nationalism in the international uh, 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 arena. Mm. And so uh, some Christians are very uncomfortable with the modern human rights movement, seeing it as, uh, as secular. And so I have no such worries, as Desmond Tutu has said, that since each of us is made in the image of God, then we are God's carriers. And um, politics is part and parcel of the city, of who we are. And I don't see any contradiction in not being partisan, but in ensuring that the citizens of each country are treated with the dignity with which they were created. Maybe going back to you there, Archbishop uh, Antje, how do you, because you mentioned now, uh, Archbishop Tabo, human rights and the UN Charter of Human Rights, and that they do relate to each other. Um, how, do you, how do you see that? Because thinking, being a, for example, Act Church of Sweden, being working on development and relief is, is part of the church's mission and also working, you know, based on human rights and so on, and you and UN Human Rights Charter, do they ever contradict, or do they always go hand in hand, or how do we see that? Contradict what? Human rights and? And the church's prophetic voice, for example. Mm. You, you, um, Archbishop Tabo mentioned that here, but I just wanted to go a little bit deeper into that. How do they relate to each other? Um, I think in, in our, I mean, everything here is a matter of discernment, uh, and, and I think discernment can be difficult also in churches. Uh, I mean, going back to the history, it took the Lutheran World Federation quite some time to arrive at the decision they did when they suspended the membership of churches that uh, promoted apartheid. But they made it, in the end, a status confessionis, uh, that you can't embrace apartheid and be part of a, the Lutheran World Federation, the Lutheran Communion. That was a prophetic statement at that, that point. Uh, now, the human rights discourse, I think in our time, um, when we uh, have to translate the theological language into mm -hmm. a more like secular language, we often use the language of the human rights. Mm -hmm. And I think that is, that is correct. 
uh, because the human rights are, are very much reconcilable and maybe even derived from the first account of creation that we have in Genesis 1. God created uh, human beings, mm -hmm. men and women, in God's image. Mm -hmm. uh, and that is the basis for equal rights. Mm -hmm. uh, you have to say that human beings are born, every human mm -hmm. being is born free and equal mm -hmm. in dignity and rights. So that is perfectly reconcilable with, with um, uh, not only mm. Christian faith, but mm. also, of course, uh, mm. uh, in Judaism. Um, I think it, it um, is not only reconcilable, but also an expression of uh, biblical faith. Uh, and it has the potential of being understood regardless of national, cultural, religious, political uh, context. <laughs> now, of course, this is not totally true. <laughs> it's It's... I, I would like it to be true, but uh, we also know, and you know that from Act uh, Church of Sweden, that in some contexts uh, the human rights are perceived as being sort of uh, right-wing because they emphasize the right of the individual person, not of the mm. collective. And uh, in our context, we sometimes encounter uh, this perception that the human rights is a leftist question. Mm. Uh, so it's not as universal as the fathers and mothers of the uh, Universal Declaration of the Human Rights um, intended it to be. Mm. But I think that is a challenge to us to, to step up and, and claim the universality of the human rights while at the same time saying, well, they c they are they were formulated at a time when we were not as much aware uh, of our connection to the planet to th the rest of creation as we are today. So we need to like imagine that this should be part of the human rights uh, as well. Because if we don't take care of the creation that nourishes us, we will not be able to keep up the human rights in the long run. And they are a foundation for democracy. And democracy is, after all, the best way of organizing society that we have, uh, we have uh, discovered so far. No, I hear you saying we are on a common journey here, uh, where we, we have to reclaim this every time, it seems. But you were saying also that democracy is something that the best, the best form we have uh, identified so far. And we know that there are, our democratic values are challenged today on many levels, globally, uh, nationally in Sweden, mm. we know. And I want to, to continue my discussion with you, Håkan, here, because our Prime Minister, uh, Stefan Löfven, he actually has recently, on, on several occasions, stressed specifically this, exactly this, the urgency uh, uh, of action and the danger of inaction in the struggle again, against uh, anti-democratic forces. He said recently, um, and I'm going to have a quote in Swedish here. Now, uh, nu, nu är det på allvar. Det finns demokratiskt valda aktörer som hotar vissa delar av demokratin. Nu är det dags att stå på rätt sida av historien. Um, it's for real now. It's serious now. There are democratic, democratically elected actors who are threatening parts of our democracy. Now it's time to stand up or stand on the right side uh, of history. And, and I want to, because this is something, the reason we're also here to discuss these common issues and we're, how can we move forward in this. And uh, the government has also initiated something called the drive, a drive for democracy, trying to focus and stress democratic values and support that globally. And I want to ask you, Håkan, being an ambassador in South Africa, where you have very actively worked with this initiative, why, why uh, what have been the, um, what are the main um, challenges, would you say, that this drive for democracy, this initiative is trying to face, both on a, on a global level? That was not a yes and no question. Uh, very much not. Uh, <laughs> so I will just uh, briefly say some words. Uh, South Africa is a um, strong democracy, but this democracy has been under attack. And we must realize that uh, the constitution is progressive and strong. Uh, court of law works. Uh, 
parliament is doing their very best. The fight against corruption is on its way in progress now. Um, so many, this freedom of speech, media, for example. So South Africa is a democracy to all means. That must be said. But over the last president time, that democracy was under attack. And uh, we added an attack to the democratic values by the former president to all parts of society. Democracy or not. Uh, so Adding Hoke, to would that, you please, uh, yeah. there was a little uh, disruption. Can you please yeah. repeat what you said? I have said that during the former presidency, South Africa was under a severe attack when it comes to defending democracy. And uh, now, with the present president, uh, the government is doing whatever they can to strengthen democracy again. And that's why so many different parts of Swedish society must be involved in this as equals in dialogue. Because South Africa now need to win democracy once again. Uh, and um, that's, uh, for me, an important message to, to, to address the Swedish audience. Mm. Uh, democracy is not just the right to vote. Mm. It is also the right to be active in society, to be an active partner, to be able to uh, be involved in decision making in your municipality, at the workplaces, where you live, where you stay, your houses, and so on. And that is under severe threat, I think, all over the world. Uh, Sweden, here in South Africa. For example, we have an upcoming election now, local election, and two-thirds of the one who will have the right to vote in the upcoming local election, 1st of November, had not even registered. And among the young people, the youth, it has been told to me that less than 10% had registered to vote. So 90% of the young people turned their back to democracy or at least to the political system. Nine out of 10 among the youth. So the question that must be asked is where will they go? They are poor, they are unemployed, they are desperate, they are starving, they have no faith in politics, democracy, they have lost faith in their own future, and nine out of ten will not even take part in local elections. That, of course, is in a severe, severe trouble problem for democracy. And uh, South Africa has struggled hard for many years. During the last presidency, there was uh, a robbery, state robbery. It's called state capture, where so many corrupt political leaders on all levels, up to the presidency, stole whatever they could and uh, helped businessmen, business in other countries, India, China to get extremely rich on this corrupt system that the poor people now is paying the bill for. This is a hunger economy. 50 percentage are 50 percent are unemployed. Seven out of 10 young people are unemployed. I have been told that up to 50 percent of every South Africans fear that they cannot feed the family the next week. And with upcoming elections, this financial crisis has also resulted in that electricity, water supply, housing, and whatever doesn't work in a way. So there are no faith in local politicians. So this young democracy now is on a very, very thin thread where so many say this was not what we thought democracy should be. No, and if I can continue that with Archbishop Tabo, um, when we saw the demonstrations in July, um, when people took to the streets and we saw looting, we saw 
uh, destruction and a lot of violence. You commented a lot about that in the media, and and in one at one point you said we need to deeply reflect upon what our country has become. We cannot go on as we are. We need to reset our compass and choose a different direction. What direction would you say the country needs to take? Thank you so much. I, I think, um, uh, Hakan, thank you so, so much for highlighting the fact that uh, uh, we are uh, such an unequal uh, society in the world. Bank statistics says uh, actually in the whole world. And uh, when some of us really uh, worked for democracy, maybe we were naive. We thought uh, democracy will bring uh, the fruits whose dividends uh, we will all enjoy uh, and, 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 and share equitably. Uh, but uh, that, is, uh, that is not the case. And as Hakan said, uh, the inequality we see in South Africa is a microcosm of what we see uh, internationally, where the, the elites are reproducing themselves and the poor struggle to break the bonds of poverty. So we face an international struggle to bring about a more equitable global economic system. And I think the international uh, uh, ecumenical community can speak out against the way in which the market economy, which currently dominates the world, works against the interests of African nations uh, in, in particular. Um, I think we need to take seriously uh, the market economy and how uh, the global management market economy uh, is, is, is run. But equally, we need, uh, as a cleric, to take seriously the fact that, uh, you know, sorry to use theology, theological jargon, uh, you, you know, the incarnate Christ, you know, the theology, the theme of the incarnation, that God is with us, is one of us, and God sees the everydayness of the suffering people of South Africa. And God uh, wants uh, us to remove uh, that burden. Uh, he wants justice. He wants us to speak the gospel of peace. So the moral compass that we need to set is to actually ensure that no one uh, is left behind. Uh, it is the incarnate Christ saying, none of his creative order, whether animate or inanimate, need to be explored by the elite who have created a market economic system that excludes the majority of, of the poor. So that is a moral dilemma. And that needs to change before we even uh, just feed uh, the poor of the poor. But you need to ask, why are they continuously poor? Mm. And maybe uh, going back to you, Archbishop, what, what do you say about what we're saying here? We have talked about the global challenges such as the vaccine, um, the, vac the, the unequal distribution of vaccine. We are also this fall having a big conference, the COP in Glasgow, discussing common challenges when it comes to climate change. What do you say about what the Archbishop uh, Tabu said here? What's your reflection upon that? Um, I think that um, things are more connected than we usually assume. I think one of the big challenges in our time, speaking, speaking uh, from our uh, point of view, that we are constantly confronted with challenges on a global level. There is a risk that people turn inside and become very local. I think one of the things we need to claim as, as churches um, that we need to be global. We need to both pay attention to the global challenges and the local challenges. And, and one of the challenges that, that 
cut through this all is what we were talking about uh, some minutes ago, namely democracy. Uh, we have in our part of the world, I think we have been too, we have been overconfident that democracy is like um, spiraling on forever and ever and ever. And it's only uh, for the past years that we have realized that polarization and populism and protectionism and post-truth and, and patriarchy as well are actually a threat to democracy because one of the results is hate speech. Um, another tendency we see is that consumerism in our part of the world, consumerism has, uh, so to speak, um, um, uh, suppressed citizenship. Um, I think some people have the sort of the perception that if you vote, cast your vote as a citizen, that is like pushing a, the like button on Facebook. Um, or it's like choosing between different products that the parties are supposed to serve. But what we need to recover is citizenship. And uh, I think the, a major characteristic of citizenship is actually contributing now, and of course, that means that people who are deprived of their possibilities to actually contribute to society, they need the empowerment, both mentally, but also like physically, so that people actually can contribute and feel that they, they um, as citizens, both in a nation, but also as citizens in the realm of God, uh, have something to offer. How can that be done? You said physically they, they can be empowered to contribute. What, what would that mean in reality? Well, it means, of course, uh, uh, humanitarian help, that that is mean uh, needed. It means uh, empowerment mm -hmm. when it comes to counteracting um, like patriarchal structures that um, uh, have a devastating impact mm -hmm. on uh, women and children and in the end on men as well mm. because as long as we we don't have mm. equality and gender justice uh, we deprive not only women and children mm. from their flourishing mm. but in the end also men and we need to mm. see that and, and that in turn has consequences for how we are going you mentioned mm. COP how we are going to to deal with climate change or the climate emergency. And I was thinking what you said here, you said that people who might not know their rights need to be informed. And, and, and I was also thinking that relating back to what Ambassador Håkan said about the young generation in South Africa then, uh, the generation called the born free, who were not part of the uh, liberation movement and have not reaped those uh, you know, gifts that were said that would come to them. So they, they don't have that history and they, they're standing with nothing but a lot of challenges. And Håkan, you mentioned that there is a lot of, there's lack in, um, in, in trust in politicians. And I saw you waved your hands, so maybe you had something else to add, but may I add, if in your answer here, may I also add a question then um, that you could answer as well. Being a politician yourself, or maybe a former politician, I should say, I don't know if it's the same as being a priest where you have a live lo long live, uh, how to say, calling, to be a politician, it might not be the same. Still, you have that experience. What do you think the politicians need to do today to earn trust as well, especially when it comes to a young generation, looking at the situation in South Africa, but possibly also in Sweden? I will not give any advices to Swedish politicians. Uh, but, uh, but you have experience. But I, after my... I, I did 23 years in Swedish Parliament, and uh, I think that the most successful political movements and politicians are the ones that are focusing on what they would like to achieve and welcoming the voters uh, into a journey into the future, saying, if you vote for us, we would like already next year do this, and the year after that, so in five years' time, we will reach that goal to, to welcome me as a voter to some sort of journey into a future that I think sounds nice and interesting. Um, more focus on that instead of criticizing your opponent. 
uh, I would like to vote for politicians and party that take me serious and welcome me to the journey into the future they would like to see. Uh, said that democracy, um, the, the challenge of democracy is that democracy takes time. And we are living today in a society that there is no time. Everything must be immediately now, 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 now. And when I met with the students uh, during my time in Parliament, sometimes I ask them, do you think the most perfect democracy would be if we took decisions that Parliament do today by our cell phones. The 8 million Swedes that had the right to vote, instead of involving Parliament, you will just have 10 or 15 questions per week, answer yes or no on that. Would you describe that as a democracy? And everyone said yes. That would be the best democracy. And I said, there is just one small problem with that theory. Most of democracy is to listen to someone else, to hear the argument for someone else. That's democracy. If you're just taking decision of the opinion you have right now, that's not democracy. That's public polls maybe. But democracy must be you and I engaged, talking, discussion, discussing, and also listen and learn from each other. Democracy takes time, and I don't know. Maybe that's the largest challenge, that everyone demands the result immediately. But uh, I think also that the lack of faith in politicians and political parties is universal. And uh, the demand for a strong leader, authoritarian leader, is getting stronger and stronger all over the world. In Europe, United States maybe is an example of that, and other countries. A leader that says this, this, this is the way that we should do it. Because democracy also demands that we spend some of our time to study different alternatives. Spend our time not just watching Netflix, but also study the different political parties' ideas. And if we are not ready to do that, well, then, of course, we will lose it. This is actually what uh, you, uh, Archbishop Antje, said. We had an election uh, last, last Sunday uh, to your institution, Church of Sweden, and you said that it's not only a right to vote, but it's, uh, it's an obligation, I believe you said. Well, yeah, I think it's, I said it's almost a moral obligation as, as long as people uh, in our world risk their lives or even lose their lives for the right to to vote in democratic elections mm. we who have the right mm. should actually use it because we know democracy is not there forever mm. if it's not maintained entertained mm. by by citizens i think what what Hokan said is a beautiful illustration of what it means to be a citizen mm. to listen to each other to engage in even fierce discussion mm. with the aim to to get to the best solutions um, and to contribute uh, and to take the time for that, to invest time in that. That is to be a responsible citizen and that is the kind of people we want to, the, ki the kind of kids and young people we want to raise. Yeah, and, the, and, the, and looking at that, the situation in South Africa, Archbishop uh, Tabu, yes. Um, what what could we learn, you know, from the social movements of the day? Are there tools, experiences that, that we could apply today and maybe support our young generation in, in reclaiming these rights, understanding the responsibility, yet also having the right to ex exercise them? Uh, yeah, yes, uh, I, I think, uh, as my fellow panelists have said, uh, the, the young people of today may take uh, the right to vote as uh, uh, for granted. Uh, uh, we had to fight for it, and many a people uh, uh, died. So the young people uh, now have the uh, have the vote, and um, we we all need uh, to know how to pull the right levers in order to bring transformation 
uh, in our society. Uh, the young people also need to say, uh, yes, democracy is important. Uh, when an elephant, as Archbishop Desmond uh, used to say, has put its leg on top of a mouse, uh, the mouse uh, will not be impressed when the elephant says democracy takes a long time because then uh, the power balance are not the same. In South Africa, we really need to work very hard within the democratic dispensation to give the young people a voice to say this democratic dispensation is built on intergenerational inequality. Uh, what are the laws, the policies, the principles that uh, we can uh, 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 redress in order to have wealth tax, in order to have uh, policies that help those young people who are born in poor families, who may actually end up uh, being poor themselves, having poor children, having poor education, and then others who are born into wealth, uh, due to inequalities of apartheid, having wealth, having good education, and having access to everything. So we need uh, to temper with the, uh, what I call the everydayness of this democratic dispensation in South Africa. But what the young people can learn uh, today from us is what I think, uh, what my fellow panelists said initially, the courage to speak out the courage to speak up and the courage to really engage in this democratic processes as we together build the future of South Africa. And how would you say practically, because you were saying something as well about that the church has a role in this, to be part of actually supporting these young people. How can it do that? So practically, uh, I go back to what I had raised, the world economic order is creating excessive poverty, excessive inequality, and our young people need to look at the world economic order and really look at how can they propose a world economic order that respect the dignity of everyone, that deals with inequality of equality, that ensures that the dividends of everybody that works the land is, is equally distributed and shared by those. Young people need to be involved like Greta in ensuring uh, that they push back on some of the things that creates climate injustice, environmental injustice. They need to challenge some of the mining companies and others that come and mine and leave homes uh, unfilled. Uh, it is their future. They need to really take education quite seriously also and know that much as they are South Africans, they belong also into an international world. So those are really uh, three things. But also they need to speed up uh, in terms of vaccine nationalism. Uh, I'm glad now the countries uh, are sharing of vaccines now. And when they share the vaccine, now the young people are saying, uh, why now? But they need to really engage themselves in the everydayness of what makes a democratic uh, uh, country uh, democratic. Thank you. We're soon uh, getting to the end of this very interesting discussion and I want to thank all the three of you for, for sharing your thoughts and reflections on what we can do to be part of this, um, this struggle for democracy. Um, and I want to, to close the discussion here by maybe asking the three of you if you have any, what your takeaway will be from, from the discussion we've had here today um, and what, what will stay with you. And I don't know who I could ask uh, to start. Maybe I could ask our ambassador, Horkian Juval, to start. Thank you. It's a 
true privilege to to be one of the three in this discussion and excellent moderated too. So I uh, just want to uh, say that uh, the support that Sweden gave during the anti-apartheid time involved whole of society. The government was the government that actually was the first to address this human rights issue, issue of democracy, and supported in a way that I don't know exactly the figures, but six, seven, eight billion Swedish crowns, so more than that, probably. Uh, that's tremendous effort by the Swedish taxpayers. As we have touched upon earlier, churches, trade unions, individuals, society, journalists, authors, uh, so many culture, musicians, artists, the whole society jointly said this is a way to treat people, rule a country that cannot be accepted. And uh, political discussions were there, but that's not my main point. My main point is most of the Swedish society were united. And I think that's the only answer to the tricky questions we have discussed today too. How will we be able to defend democracy in South Africa or in Sweden mm. or in other countries. We can never ask Parliament to do that. Mm. If nine out of ten young voters in South Africa say we will not even take part in local elections, then we understand that mm. Parliament is not the one that can solve this problem or this challenge. Mm. That must be done jointly by all of us to share these values. So I'm very thankful that you have had this discussion mm -hmm. and I had the opportunity to meet with you, looking forward to meet with you physically. Mm -hmm. And uh, I will just end up by quoting because Nelson Mandela visited the Swedish parliament two times. And the first time was directly when he was liberated, when he was sent out from, from prison. Uh, I was not there then. But the second time, 1999, I think it was 1999, the farewell tour, I visited a couple of European countries. And at that time, uh, we had a statue of, we still have a statue, but that statue of Olaf Palme in the parliament. And I was there. So I saw Mandela and uh, his team entering the room where the statue of Olaf Palme were. And he has stopped 50 feet away from the statue, looked into the eyes of Olaf Palme, and he stood there for at least five minutes, silent, and all of us could see that they actually talked to each other. They connected, and so much that Mandela would have said to him while he was alive, mm. he said most of that, or a lot of that, to him, represented by, by this statue. And it was a touching moment, mm. and then, he gave a, a speech in, in, the, in the larger chamber, the second chamber, and I was there. And I actually printed that speech before our talk here. And he said, and I quote Mandela in the Swedish parliament, 1999, and I was one of the members, listen. We thank you and thank the millions you represent for making it possible for us to say that we have a true friend whose name is Sweden. A fact. Thank you so much. Thank you, Okan. Thank you for reminding us about that. And thank you for being where you are to facilitate the relation, the continued relationship between Sweden and South Africa. And moving on to Archbishop uh, Tabu, what would your final reflections be? My, my final reflections also uh, will be borrowed from an African proverb that says, the road is made by walking it. Uh, we have walked with the people of Sweden and uh, we, as, my, as the ambassador said, it's been a, a very reaffirming journey, very important journey and uh, the road, as Mandela said, 
is a long road. Mm -hmm. And uh, it cannot end now that we are in democratic dispensation and the relations are now fiscal. Uh, we still need those cultural people. Uh, we still need partnership in religious uh, uh, context. We still need such, such dialogues mm. so that you can learn, we can learn, and we can make South Africa uh, what Mandela and those that died and those that from Sweden helped us to be where we are, uh, attain that goal. Youth unemployment is still sitting at 43.7%, uh, which makes a lot of from Sweden to help genuinely some of those youth. Uh, we are reaching out yet again, not in apartheid South Africa, but in democratic South Africa, to say uh, there is a challenge. Uh, in vaccine education, in vaccine fear, in sharing of the vaccine, um, at your country level, uh, it is important to continue to share. But nothing beats walking the road together uh, as we reduce inequalities in South Africa and uh, globally. So I thank uh, you for this opportunity. Uh, to reflect uh, with you on this very important heritage uh, weekend in South Africa. Thank you. Thank you for reminding us about walking the road together. And that's why we are here today. And our final words, we would like to, uh, I would like to ask you, um, Archbishop Antje, to, to share. Mm. Thank you. Well, thank you for these uh, great contributions. Uh, I think we need to acknowledge that we currently, we adults, are leaving a lot of unpaid checks to our kids and grandkids and their kids. Unpaid checks in regard to climate justice, economic justice, gender justice, vaccine justice, and you could go on. And one way one important way of addressing th that I think our conversation has shown is that we need to keep the memories alive and tell the stories of justice. Mm. And by that I mean the stories of divine justice, mm. the gospel of Jesus Christ, mm. but also the stories of human justice, mm. like the anti-apartheid struggle, but also like all the things that are happening, not least mm. through ACT Church of Sweden, uh, in its diligent work together with local partners mm. in establishing trust. Mm. Um, and it seems to me that trust really is the hard currency in the future mm. to address all those global uh, and serious challenges that are facing humankind altogether in these days. Uh, climate, also um, international migration, driven by climate and by economic injustice and by a lack of democracy and all this. Um, um, and also what digitalization will bring about mm. in terms of social challenges. Um, and trust, that also implies, I think, w that we need um, encourage partnerships between state, the state, and civil society, including mm. Uh, faith communities mm. and it uh, in turn entails that not only Christian faith communities need to to build trust mm. it also extends to interfaith uh, dialogue and relationships mm. uh, and my last point would be that in all that we I think we we can we must mm. uh, and uh, uh, we will be able to cultivate hope and, and hope to me means that uh, a hope that is credible mm. is a hope that empowers action. And it does that by harboring the anger mm. about all that which is not right. Mm. And it mm. also has a strong sense of realism. Mm. You can ca call it a, ca a sense of humility. Humankind as connected to humus, 
the earth, um, and that, in that sense, uh, bound for humility. And it is also this uh, courage mm. we started with. That in most situations, I think we still have a choice to choose the path of uh, courage, mm. and hopefully walking that path of courage together with many others. So that will be my final comment. Thank you so much. So let that be uh, what you take away from this uh, seminar that we had here today. Thank you so much, all three of you, Thank for what you. you've shared, the experience of your, your lives. You are senior citizens, one should say, <laughs> uh, that have lived uh, a, long and, uh, a long life where you have learned a lot and you share that with us. So let us take away the uh, image of courage, walking the road together and building trust among each other. We know the challenges ahead, but we know that we can also work that road together. Thank you so much. Thank you. I forgot to say happy birthday to Desmond Tutu. Uh, in a few weeks' time, he turns 90. Thank you. Definitely. Desmond Tutu's birthday is also one of the reasons we actually have had this seminar here today. So thank, thank you for reminding me. Thank you. Roger. Bye-bye. Thank you. <laughs>